With Raccoon City becoming an entire cluster of absolute insanity, seeing as every B.O.W. in existence and T-Virus as well as G-Virus were basically being dropped left, right, and center, it would seem that largely it became a playground for Umbrella USA as well as Umbrella Europe to test out their experiments. These experiments were intentional, such as the deployment of Mr. X and Nemesis. Others, such as the Hunters, were somewhat intentional, whereas the Gammas were failed experiments. Even the standard infected, while an accident, were used as something to be studied. However, with so much going on and infecting, apart from civilians caught in the crossfire, everything seemed to be purposefully done. And that is the exact creature we will be covering today. Largely further downstream from an intentional release, these creatures known as Drain Demos would take over a power plant for the immediate area and then begin building a nest. This infection would seem to suggest that an ecosystem could be born outside of the T-virus exposure completely on its own. So in today's episode, we will discuss these creatures as well as where they come from and why their physiology presents the way it is. So let's get to it. As you move your way through the burning ruins of Raccoon City, currently besieged by monsters and infected, you outrun Nemesis and then finally make your way down into the subway. After following Carlos down to the platform, you find out that there are actually survivors down there and there's a plan to take the train out of the city before it's turned to ash via a nuke. You're sent back up to the surface where you make your way through the city streets. Entering the train control station, it becomes quite clear things aren't powered the way they should be. Someone or something has knocked it out, and without the ability to get it back on, there is no hope for getting any of the civilians out. Putting out the fire on the side of the building, Jill heads towards the power plant responsible for keeping the train station functional. While there, she begins to understand what exactly is going on and why it's absolutely horrifying. Looking out the window on the top floor, the lines, transformers, really any structure out out there, it's covered with nothing but a mass of hive-looking material. Presumably, this is what is knocking out the power for literally the entire area, and luckily for Jill, power pylons must be reset manually from within the hive material. Descending the stairs, Jill happens across a person who likely tried to complete the same task Jill now finds herself trying to complete. This person is not so much infected as they are actually just blown open. Finding their note, they state that these creatures jump them and then slam something down their throat. Their stomach started to hurt really bad shortly after that, and they mention how green herbs appear to counteract the parasite and as a result could be used to counteract these creatures entirely and cause you to puke them up. However, if you run out, you're just entirely screwed. Looking at these insects, it's clear that they have some relation to animals and their creation is completely and easily explainable, but before getting there, let's first talk about their morphology as it'll give us a pretty clear idea as to why they've changed into this form versus where they initially come from. Starting with the multiple feet, we can see that this creature is what is known as a hexapod, meaning that it has six legs and six feet or specifically, in most insects' case, six toes. Interestingly, they're actually called pseudo-arachnids, if you didn't know. Basically, the insects that I really dislike are the ones with all the legs, so this is fantastic. On the fore and hind limbs in particular, this creature possesses a large, sharp talon that is able to help it traverse in its environment. The mid limbs have a longer scythe-like appendage used for slashing and also self-defense of the environment, but it can also be used to grasp onto prey for other nefarious means, such as implanting its young, which has likely inspired many an online video disturbing. Moving further up the forelimbs, we see that interestingly, this creature is no longer just hydraulic pressure that insects are usually known for, which if you didn't know, insects actually move their body by differences in pressure in their segmented pieces. They don't actually have anything that's pulling on the limb itself. But with this particular creature, it has now grown muscle. And considering the T-virus is born out of tampering with a virus utilizing human genes, this has unsurprisingly spread to this creature. The muscle tissue appears to be about roughly the same size as a human forearm, but much likely stronger. Moving further down the forelimb, we see that this creature still has a tough carapace in place, but it's likely, instead of fluids making it move as we have just discussed, muscle is now located underneath this carapace. Where the forearms attached to the main body is a combination of muscle and exoskeleton as well. Moving to the midlimbs, this creature likely relies on the sharpness of the scythe as opposed to the strength needed in the legs, because what we see with the midlimbs is that they're actually smaller than those of the front and back limbs. But this has shown that you can see there is a continuation of the exoskeleton without all the added extra muscle. Still, however, it is more than likely that this muscle does exist and really isn't just likely because it is. You can actually see it if you look carefully. The scythe themselves are a minimum of about 12 inches in length or about 0.3 meters. Multiple jagged points at the top have formed on either scythe. The hind limbs are much like the front limbs in that the muscle located here has been increased. Again, considering these creatures are hanging upside down and moving quite quickly, accompanied with a cancerous level of growth, the added muscle tissue is quite necessary. On the toes specifically, another jagged 
jagged talon juts off, likely to help stabilize their grasp on prey. Further up the leg, we see that the exoskeleton does appear to be a bit beefier, likely to protect the creature from the back. And considering it is a multi-jointed leg, this would be quite necessary, because if one of those joints breaks, the entire leg could become useless. Getting to around the mid-body of this creature, their stomach appears with a section of many yellow half orbs on their abdomen. We will discuss what this is and why this is the case, but moving around to the back of this creature, we see a thick green exoskeleton plating. This plating would likely protect the creature from any sort of melee weapon, making an average human incredibly easy prey for these beasts. On top of this armor sits many spikes, likely as hard as the armor itself, and sharp, and this would make it very difficult for anyone to grapple with it without injuring themselves or even jump on it in an attempt to scuffle with it up close. Moving to the head of the creature, it is just flat out ugly. The head appears to have lost any of the structuring at this point, and instead a giant gaping maw with many tentacles along with something known as a ovipositor is used to jam down the throats of humans that it has taken a hold of. Speaking of giant tentacle, the main tentacle is used to infect humans and is quite muscular and possesses a central tube. This tube runs from the center of the creature where it has stored its unfertilized young, which is presumably within those yellow orbs, and then injects it straight into the stomach of unsuspecting prey. So getting a good look at this creature, it's clear to see that this thing likely evolved from insects, seeing as it definitely possesses a carapace and structuring of its body is exceedingly similar. No lab created this infectious beast, and instead it is simply a byproduct of unchecked capability of the T-Virus. So seeing as it has six legs, it appears to prefer human prey, what is it? Well, it's clear that this particular insect is known as a hematophagus insect or a blood-sucking insect. Usually when you hear about blood-sucking insects, it's pretty typical for your mind to instantly jump to mosquitoes, but I would have to say this one is definitely not a mosquito. With the ability to live in a colony-like structure, seeking out blood, and the structuring of its body even being heavily influenced by the T-Virus, I would have to say it's actually just a common flea, believe it or not. It is stated that this creature has molted quite a bit, and as a result, in a lot of areas of its exoskeleton, it has been twisted and changed, much like any of the other infected that we see. This has given us the demos that we see here. Interestingly, the first iteration of this creature actually preferred the cerebral spinal fluid of humans and would consume it at an unchecked rate. In the original RE3, this would obviously induce massive trauma to the spinal cord and a complete collapsing of the brain after all the fluid was drained, which in turn would lead to brain damage and eventual end for the host. However, with the remake, these creatures appear to be really in a reproduction cycle, so it appears much less interested in the CSF than in the original, and really would just like to impregnate humans. Gross. But instead, these particular fleas are completely female. Being all female, this would mean that they are asexual as well and need a host in order to fully grow their young. Due to the T-virus' ability to interact with the human genome quite effectively, this means that the flea's young after being injected into the abdomen of a person and upon coming into contact with the body of a human, this may mean that it's actually borrowing cellular DNA from that person to incorporate in its own incomplete genetic coding of their body. As a result, they grow quite quickly within humans and when we see things like muscle and ligaments which are formed within the mutant flea population as a result, it's pretty clear to see that there is some other genetic variants going on here. Their bodies are also fairly grotesque looking as because they would continue to molt over and over again at a much faster rate due to the large, roughly dog-sized creature they end up becoming, I would have to say that this particular growth rate actually stems from the human genome as opposed to the flea genome. And this would also have the implications of increasing metabolism to keep up with the demands of growth. So before getting to how this thing takes you out, how exactly did it come to be what it is? Well, it's clear to me that whether we like it or not, most of us live with parasites. It's just the name of the game on planet Earth. And in this case, likely someone was living with fleas, which is really not too far-fetched. But an even more clear origin point to me would likely be a dog. Considering we see dogs throughout Raccoon City, it would really explain where these things come from. That said, the species origin is kind of irrelevant. The flea came into contact with tainted blood at some point where the infection began to alter it. Now, there may even still be fleas on infected, and it is said that the shambling masses that are out there right now can still be infected by the demos. But after the fleas of that colony, along with likely other colonies, colonies grew to considerable size, they became large enough to continue on the infection process. Typically, fleas do lay eggs on animals that will then hatch. However, fleas naturally do not reproduce asexually and instead require a male and a female to mate. Most times, multiple males are needed to reach full fertilization status. However, with that said, female fleas can lay unfertilized eggs at the same time if they have not mated, meaning that regardless, eggs do come out. With the demos, because it's an all-female colony, likely the unfertilized egg capability became a mutation. This mutation was then supplemented with a type of bonding agent, which was the T-virus, as it is known to do this with things like reptilian and human DNA to create
create the hunters. This allows them, as stated before, to use the DNA found in the stomach and intestines of this person to bridge the gap from unfertilized to fertilized young. And this brings us to how this creature takes you out. Ever had acid reflux before? Well, this is way worse. After the creature jams its ovipositor down your throat, the eggs are implanted into your stomach. Once there, they begin to fester and mutate as well as grow. Growing being the painful part. By growing large enough, this would induce tremendous pain in the abdomen of the host. However, the growth will continue. Once reaching a viable size, the creature will then burst from the abdomen, causing massive internal bleeding and shock, which will result in expiration of the host quite quickly. What I do find interesting apart from all of this, however, is the addition of green herb will cause these creatures to become agitated enough that the host can then vomit them up safely. This is strange as it seems like the green herb may in some way impact the T-virus's ability to bond genetic coding, resulting in fertilized eggs. And because of this, the body is able to expel the unfertilized eggs before they can do damage. I'm thinking at like some point, I'm gonna have to do a video literally just covering the herbs from Resident Evil because it's fairly interesting to see how they work considering the progenitor virus is really nothing but it comes from a plant, or at least from the flowers. Nothing like a video about rival plants to get the blood pumping, huh? 